Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome. This is our very, very first um, broadcast for the sex, sex work and sexualities um, section of this, of the uh, network, New Book Network. My name is Rachel Stewart. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kent and my area of interest is webcamming as a form of sexual commerce. And I've invited along um, Dr. Kate Lister to talk about her awesome book, um, The History of Sex. So Kate, tell us about the book. Tell us about, you know, what what prompted you to, to write the book. And if you could tell the listeners about your awesome um, pr- uh, project, The Halls of Yore, which I'm a huge fan of. Oh, Rachel, you're so lovely. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. I'm so excited about this. Um, <clears throat> so this I, oh, where do you even start? All right, we'll start with start, start at the beginning. Okay, so Curious History of Sex. Um, it's not my first book, but the other books I've written have been academic books, and no one ever cares about them. <laughs> like Victorian paraphernalia and just stuff like that. But So this is my first book that I've written that, you know, I, like, I really wanted to write it and I wanted to write it in my own style and I wanted to, to write it as if I'm just chatting to the reader. And one of the things that has always fascinated me about sex, which I find infinitely fascinating for many reasons, but the history of it in particular is how similar we still are and yet how vastly different and just how attitudes and scripts change all the time and just how funny it can be as well as harrowing and awful and all of those things it can be at the same time and I wanted to try and put that into a book to sort of flag up some of the curious things that people have done throughout history and done to each other and to themselves and to other people all in the pursuit of an orgasm I suppose so it's yeah it's me looking at History, it's, it's a really wide span, looking at right back into the ancient world and kind of more contemporary stuff. But it's largely areas of history that have caught my interest and my attention and things that I've found fascinating and curious about it. So I cover everything from sex work in the ancient world through to um, testicular monkey transplants in the 20th century. <laughs> and kind of everything in between so yeah and it's you know I suppose I kind of always envisioned that I might write another one because you couldn't possibly write a definitive history of sex could you you just go on and on and on so there's definitely more to be said but yeah so it's it's things that have interested me and the history of sex work is has endlessly fascinated me so it was very important to do that and one of the nice things about the book was I was able to use it to raise some money for Basis, a charity in Leeds who support sex workers and have done for 30 years. So the book itself was published with a group called Unbound, who use a slightly different model. They use a crowdfunded model to, to raise the funds. So everyone kind of pre-orders, but like years in advance. But whatever you make above the amount needed to publish the thing, you, you get to keep. So I was able to give mine to Basis. So I raised them five grand. So I was really pleased with that. I was like, yay. So it felt like not only did I manage to, you know, write a book that I'm really proud of, but also it, it can do a bit of good in the world as well. And I was re- really wanted it to do that. Excellent. Excellent. You know what? It was really funny because the first time I opened the book, I opened the book to a page with a, a big picture of an oyster. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I almost felt like I was just going to serve you some sort of copyright issue because it looked like my own genitalia, <laughs> like literally, it was like look, <laughs> looking at my baby. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And oh. I just, it just really, it instantly clarified something for me. It instantly clarified, A, why the oyster would be an aphrodisiac. I couldn't quite get my head around that before. I just thought it was because it was like slimy. But it also made me think about how, you know, how sex has been reduced in this time period, how we have reduced it to a kind of like, you know, the, the, the physical act rather than just looking at all the other stuff around it. And what I was really interested in when I was reading your book is your use of language. And I, I wondered what had got you started thinking about the terms that we use for this different, you know, genitalia for the different sex acts. 
Yeah, so like one of the things I've done in the book <clears throat> is I've tried to put in as many examples of historical slang as I possibly can. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, partly because I, it makes me laugh, you know, like reading through historical, what were people calling genitals and sex and blowjobs 200 years ago? But also because I think that language is such an important part of how we understand the world. You know, there's, it doesn't just record the world, it creates the world. And when you look at how language has evolved, you can trace cultural attitudes around it. For example, if we take the word cunt, so I'm just going to drop the, the C-bomb right there. Um, back when, <clears throat> when we can trace it to like the, its earliest uses, it wasn't an offensive word. You know, it, it, <clears throat> it turns up in, in medical texts, it turns up in, it was just, cunt was cunt it was, it was just a normal I mean it's got slightly bawdy connotations as, as cunts tend to do but when you trace it it starts to become really offensive be regarded as obscene about the, the time of Puritan um, control and when it, sexuality itself starts to become repressed uh, the sort of the later middle ages it starts taking on new connotations and then as that gets going and as attitudes change and shift it suddenly becomes the most offensive word in the English language with, well, one of them, right? But that's always blown my mind as well. It's like, how could how could a word that just means vulva possibly be that offensive? You know, and like the, and the power dynamics that's implicit in that, that we don't really question. We go, well, you know, just don't say cunt to your boss and it'll be fine. But oh, it depends who your boss is, I suppose. <laughs> but um, we don't stop to think, but what is that saying? Is that saying that cunts are the most offensive thing in the English language? Which is an odd thing to say, isn't it? Like that's that's like to, the shame around sex and sexuality and genitals is absolutely embedded in our language and how we understand the world. But it's quite odd, isn't it? If you think about it, I mean, you know, the cunt, like the vulva, is 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 the it's where life starts. Like, right, absolutely. You, you don't have life without a cunt. No. So, and why would that be so offensive? But what I really liked about um, what I sort of saw in your book as well is the origin of the word cunt and cunning. Yes. Because my cunt has been very cunning at times. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to the point it's got a life of its own. And <laughs> I, um, I, I just was really taken by your use of la language. And for anyone who doesn't know you, um, Kate does an awesome Twitter account called The Halls of Yore, where she, you know, she lists like words of uh, for different anatomical bits of the human body, different actions. So, you know, Halls of Yore on Twitter, go and, go and, go and find it and you'll, you'll have fun there. But I was um, really struck as well about about the name that you use for Whores of Yore. So before we talk about the name, can you tell me a bit about the Whores of Yore? Yes. So it's um, it kind of, I'd love to tell you that it was a really well thought out and well plotted uh, research plan and strategy, but it wasn't, it wasn't at all. Like a lot of the things that I think are best in the world, it, it was kind of a serendipitous thing that happened. It was just, and I, I absolutely love it now and I enjoy it, but it came about because I was researching medieval sex workers um one day as you do and i came across the name of a a woman who'd been arrested in london in the 14th century and the name that she'd given to the authorities was clarice clatterbollocks and i just <laughs> i just fell about laughing because and like, not only is it really funny but it was obviously supposed to be funny it was supposed to be funny and like and i suddenly realized that like not only is the joke still funny 600 odd years later but sex workers still use aliases they still have kind of you know porn star names and, and stripper names and all these things and then just look how similar that is and so I was absolutely fascinated by that and I loved it and I thought I think I'm going to tweet some of this stuff because I just find the most random fantastic stuff and I was messing about on Twitter because I should have been doing work and then I started a Twitter account because I went, oh, whore rhymes with your, look at me, I'm so funny. <laughs> like an absolute tit. And then I started it not thinking anything of it at all. And people just started, I guess people also agree with me that Clarice Clatterbollocks is really fucking funny. And then, you know, and then I started tweeting more stuff and then other people started sending me stuff and then it, it, it grew and grew. And now this is kind of, this is what I do. It's, it's my baby. And yeah, that's where it, it came from. So it sort of took on a life of its own. 
yeah. yeah. I liked, I, I also sort of, I, I noticed that you said that you probably shouldn't have used the word, uh, the phrase horse mm. of your, and I just, I, do, I was quite surprised that sex workers had said that they didn't like that because I've not always been as mainstream as I am nowadays, okay, and that's all I'm going to say on air, but, I, you know, I have a certain entitlement to the phrase whore. And I actually really like it. And I like it a lot more than sex worker because worker implies laborer. And I was definitely not laborer. I was far more professional than a laborer. And a lot of what I would do was less, was less work than it was hustle or mm. less work than it was like intuitively knowing what somebody wants. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think sex work implies as a physical labor that I don't think necessarily belongs in the realm of sex work. Like, don't get me wrong. Yeah, there is a certain amount of labor involved, but I don't think sex work really covers it well enough. And I think hall does. I like the word hall. I love the word whore. But it, it's like, that's one of the interesting things about the way language works, though, isn't it? Is words so rarely have one meaning. And even if you think you know what it means, it doesn't mean that to somebody else. Yeah. So to me, the word whore, I like it too. I, I, I like it because it feels it has a slightly archaic thing like harlot and strumpet. I kind of like that bit about it. But also it's got that slightly like naughty, like, yeah, I am a massive whore. And it's kind of like a, 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 a reclamation thing. But that is a very different perspective from somebody who has been called a whore by an arresting police officer or the, who has been, who's had that word used against them, not as a kind of a state of reclamation, but as an insult. So I've had that fed back to me by people that I, I shouldn't use it, that I don't have a right to use it. And I, I understand that. And it's interesting as well, because I've, I've done sex work, you know, not like full time or anything like that, but I've, but it's kind of interesting of like, well, and who, who gets to, to use it is it okay that I use it because I have done sex work in the past or do I have to have done a certain amount of sex work to be able to be allowed to use it and it's like you know like what are these rules and we're constantly renegotiating them all the time but I think as well the word doesn't just apply to people that sell sex I think that unfortunately most women have been called a whore at some point Absolutely. and you you don't have to be selling sex in order to have been called a whore it's like it's like slag isn't it oh yeah slag or your slut. It's just the go-to random weird way that you would attack a woman. And I thought that was really important as well. Like, why is that the insult? Well, yeah. And it doesn't matter. Like Joan of Arc, who died a virgin, famously, that was her big thing. That was her brand. I am a virgin. And what did the English do? We went, whore. What? <laughs> just, like, that's just, just so lazy. <laughs> what did we get? Is that the best that we could have come up with? Slag. It just do you know what I mean? <laughs> So I thought that's, because that's what it symbolises as well, doesn't it? Is whenever a woman gets too full of herself or too powerful or needs to take it down a peg or two, that's it. That's where you go, is yeah. you attack a sexuality. But it's quite funny, isn't it, as well? It tells us a lot about how we consider, like, the female genitalia. Yes. So, so you, you could be as smart as you want. I mean, there are several people walking around on this planet with scars who have chosen the word whore in the wrong context when talking to me. Yeah, because actually when, <laughs> when you know, it's a reduction, isn't it? It's a reduction yeah. to your genitalia. Yes. A, a genitalia that despite being life-given, life-giving has, has been used as a kind of reductive. Yep, yep. You know? See, that's the thing is, it's like it's, you could call yourself whore or your mates could, and you know exactly how you're using it and you know exactly the parameters it's being used in. But if somebody else does it and they don't have permission and they don't have the right to do that, then they're going down, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's that, the power of the word is enormous. You know, I still get messages from people over Twitter occasionally asking me to change the name. It's kind of weird. Like I had, I had a guy the other day message me and he just said, could you, could you change the name, please? We've all got mothers and grandmas. I don't know who he thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> I emailed him back to just be like, uh, "What? I'm a what? I'm a woman." And then, then it was weird, but yeah, I, I, think, I think it's I think it's quite funny because in the time in the in the past, if that word's been used against me, and you can see by the way some of his faces after the delivery, it's like mm. there you got the bomb, and it's like, sorry, are you making a point? Yeah. Yes, and it, it's it's such a strange word because it's. It only has power if you let it 
have power, I suppose. One of my favourite people on Twitter is Stormy Daniels. I absolutely adore watching her. And what I love most about her is not just how funny she is, but how, like, these trolls that try to attack her have got nowhere to go with her because all they've got is like they say you fucking slag and then she'll tweet back and just be like yeah sound, sounds about right and it's just, do you know what I mean or like there's one like they'll call her like a dumb whore and then she'll she'll just tweet back it's just like i am not dumb and that's <laughs> it's like they've got nothing because she absolutely inhabits that she doesn't give a fuck and it's just really surreal watching the dynamics of like if you don't let it punch you where do they go yeah yeah, you know they, they've got nothing. They've got nothing more to offer. Yeah, she's she's had a lot of sex. She does not give a fuck, and it's it's just and I just love that. It's interesting to see it. Is if you don't let it shame you like that, but then it's then you know it's very hard to do. You even have that choice to choose not to be shamed. I don't know. I mean, when like when you were sort of uh, researching the book, at what point does like like sort of uh, sort of sex become transactional and then comes for going from being transactional to being frowned upon because I remember reading a book about um, sex in the Babylonian era yeah. and sex in the Babylonian era was okay as long as you were already outside the patriarchy so if you were a widow and you haven't got anyone to look after you it's fine but if you're married or you've got some money to pass on because that's how wealth is generated down through the generation. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing your thing and accidentally conceive some, some random baby, you, it might inherit somebody else's wealth it shouldn't get. So then prostitution becomes an issue in, if you're within the patriarchal sort of framework, but if you're outside, it's all good. Yeah. So yeah. I wondered, wondered how far back we go when when sort of transactional sex becomes starts to be an issue the the, the earliest records that have, that have been discovered about transactional sex they are it's ancient babylonia i think it's either three or five thousand bc i've got a scrambled brain i can't quite remember and the, it's actually a record of inheritance rights if a sex worker becomes pregnant so that is some of the earliest records, which highlights exactly what you're talking about, which is not only property rights and patriarchy, but exactly what do you do with these people, primarily women who exist outside your nice, like, nice little get married, have babies idea. Yeah. So I think that that's the earliest record that we have got of it. So it has always been with us, but attitudes to sex and sex work shift vastly throughout different cultures, there is some evidence that you could have sacred prostitution in Babylonia and ancient Mesopotamia. And I say ever because it's fiercely contested because all we've got is just fragments and hints and little bits and pieces and a myth, a foundational myth, myth in the epic of Gilgamesh of a sex worker called Shamhat who manages to civilize the wild man. But she's definitely she's definitely whoring that's her whole thing she's a priestess and she is paid to have sex with people but how much you extrapolate from that is is tricky well what does that mean does that mean that they actually existed but what you can tell is this foundational myth of ancient babylonia is she wasn't regarded as shameful not at all she was regarded as very powerful as somebody that could civilize man through her sexual skills so that isn't someone that shamed at all no so that I, I, that's that implies a kind of um an appreciation of your yes. skill set I yeah mean, it every, does if everyone's having sex but you're being paid to have sex that absolutely that, that implies a recognition of of your sexuality doesn't it it does and she was incredibly skilled she's described as a priestess uh, but she's also a harlot a temple harlot so that's uh, and she was very respected very powerful and has sex with gods and kings for yeah. money. Yeah. You know? it, I think it's quite interesting the, the discussions that we don't have mm. around uh, sort of patriarchal systems and the, the perceptions around sex work because it's really interesting when you see changes in patriarchal systems and the discussion around sex work changes. Absolutely. You know? I, I mean, I think the two most formative power structures around sex work are A, patriarchy, and B, capitalism. They're the two things. And I know that like some people think that if you, if you got rid of capitalism, you'd get rid of sex work. No I, no, I don't. I don't think that you would. I think it would look very different. I think it would look very different. I don't think you'd get rid of it. But 
all throughout history, patriarchy has massively disadvantaged women, hugely. And capitalism, we've all got to make a living somehow. We're all selling something. And throughout Western history, if you're a woman, how the hell do you get your money? How the hell? When, when especially if, if you're a kind of, where do you work? Like you could go and there were some jobs that have been open to women, but they paid pittance. It wasn't enough to live on. It was absolute pittance. You needed a man. You needed your father to support you through his family. Or you needed a husband and you needed one damn quick because they made the money and they would support you. The other option, of course, is if you want to work on your own, you sell sex. Yeah. That, and it has been throughout history, that has been a means of primarily women earning a lot of money. How else do women get money? You know, they can inherit it or they can marry it or they can shag it. Those are like your sort of your major three options, right? Yeah. I mean, I suppose ideally you'd be a widow. You'd marry someone really rich, he'd die, and then you'd go, woohoo, <laughs> I am off. But even that is dependent on a sexual labor. That's yeah. throughout history, that's been it. Yeah. And sex work has been dominated by women and it still today continues. The reason people turn to it is because you can make a lot of money in a very short space of time. Yeah. It's quite funny. I was reading a book. I can't remember who it was by. I, I want to say Sanchez, but um, it, it talked about the registration of prostitutes in in the Roman Empire. And one of the reasons was was to discourage rich women from from selling sex because it was it was independent wealth. I think another thing as well, and I'm going to sort of like move this on from this. I remember reading this book by Karras about the word spinster. And apparently the word spinster was kind of uh, synonymous with, with, with prostitute because, you know, when, when you've done the shearing and there's no more carding or whatever it is you're doing to be done, then you, you go, you, you'll do sex work until, you know, your, the cycle comes back around again. And this is a, this is a massive leap, but I'm going to make it. So we're going to go from sheep right, to I love what I really love about your book. OK, now the book's very visual. I love some of the, the pictures you've got around. It. But what really strikes me as being kind of very different to the way that we view bodies at the moment is the hairiness. <laughs> the hairiness. <laughs> so much hair. I know the hairiness of the Victorian female is is noteworthy. Is no. And I wondered when that stopped being um, attractive, when, when in the, when, you know, when porn and sort of um, other sort of sexual uh, literature stopped featuring sort of genital hair. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I tweet a lot of pictures of vintage erotica and there's certainly a lot in the book. And as you rightly point out, do you know what? That's the thing that people comment most of all on Twitter was when they see the images because we're so you were living in such an image saturated society, but our view of what is erotic and sexual is really tightly constrained. It's really stylized. We know what we expect. If you're watching porn or something erotic, even if you're just taking a selfie, we all know. You know, you do the the, the duck pout and you've got your makeup and all that stuff. But when photography was first invented, none of that existed. So people are very much trying to work out what's sexy and what you've got is very normal but beautiful bodies. They're not chiseled. They don't have six packs. They don't have, have breast implants or liposuction or tattoos. Or, and they've got a lot of hair. They've just got the natural hair because the style has not yet emerged where that looks weird. Yeah. But what's interesting to know is how strange it looks to modernize because how used we are now to seeing bodies with no hair, with no pubic hair whatsoever. That if you do see it, it looks like, oh, my God, look, there's, there's, there's pubic hair there. Um, and it's it hasn't always been that way, you know. In fact, in the Renaissance, there's a lot of body literature that really celebrates pubic hair in women. Uh, and and it's, it's regarded as like a sign of health and fertility in the same way that if, if a cat walked in and it was all kind of bold and mangy and didn't have any fur, you'd be like, oh, my God, what's wrong with it? That is very much how they viewed pubic hair. But if a cat comes in, it's got, you know, full, thick, luscious fur you like that that's a nice cat that was how they they viewed it so this you get this uh, rochester the um earl of rochester wrote the really bawdy poetry in the 17th century he at one point says that his prick will no more to bold cunt resort he says it, it sounds like rustling leather <laughs> which is a hell of an image 
wow <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and given the lack of depilation at the time it makes you wonder where it'd been going <laughs> right Actually, I think that what it was as well is something that would make your hair fall out syphilis Oh. Right, so so advanced stages of syphilis would make pubic hair fall out. But what would definitely make your hair fall out was what they used to treat syphilis, mercury. Okay. So I mean, it, it didn't do you any fucking good at all. But one of the things it did do is it made your hair fall out. So not having pubes, that was a bit of a giveaway that you had syphilis. Didn't Rochester have syphilis? Oh yes, he did. And if you think of like an STD, he had it. He was he was like a venereal disease pinata. He was just absolutely riddled with it he died really young of complications from syphilis wow. he was 36 i think and he had gonorrhea and he had a, a whole host of everything yeah i particularly liked your um your chapter about um sex work in in um oh what was that phrase you used oh i can't remember it uh, colonial sex work yes yeah I mean, because we tend to think when we think of a sort of sex work outside of the, the sort of northwest, the global northwest, we automatically start to hear these debates around trafficking and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, so poor brown people being brought to be exploited by you know in, in the global northwest. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to to hear what you'd found, you know, what you'd found when researching that chapter. Yes. So again, attitudes vastly different and one of the many lovely things that um the the westerners did when we went around the world going well we're in charge now is we brought with it all of our own attitudes around sexual morality and we didn't really bother to find out or appreciate what anyone else's attitudes were so when the british took over india they could not comprehend sexual labor or a system of I suppose they were called notch girls or devadasi who were girls that were dedicated to the goddess Yelama and they were they would raise money for um the, the temples through sex well the British were absolutely revolted by this and they set about abolishing the devadasi and the notch girls and creating shame around it and they succeeded although the practice still goes on but it's shunned and stigmatized now and quite dangerous now but the Devdasi were, you know, like they were the Kardashians of their day, man, except more useful. They, you know, they were pioneers of art and literature and poetry and, and they were lovers to kings and, and, and maharajas and they collected art and they educated. There were some super powerful women and they had, they had um, I suppose, patrons, really powerful patrons who would pay so much money to have sex with these women. Uh, and, but the sex was kind of incidental, you know, that it was just part of their world. But the British co colonizers couldn't comprehend that at all. So they set around creating shame. They set around outlawing it. And then suddenly it becomes a very dangerous practice. It becomes shamed and stigmatized and shunned. And the devdasi suddenly, they're, they, they're forced to earn their living selling sex on the streets or for dancing or coins. And, and it changes it completely. And we've managed to do that successfully all around the world done it everywhere because we can't understand what 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 that, that sex is not shameful especially female sexuality yeah i read something really interesting about the the history of the east india company mm. and the east india company um you know was very concerned that that a lot of it's it's uh, the people that are working for it, its employees and its soldiers because the, it was basically an occupying force were having relationships with with Indian women and producing mm. like mixed race children that they did not want to be able to take part sort of politically within the framework of the East India Company. Yeah. So they started a really systematic like attack on on Indian women. So women the women that were engaged in activities that weren't considered to be prostitution, yeah, might be considered on the outskirts of sex work became labelled as prostitutes and then the next thing you know they they kind of herded into these places called Lao bazaars which is like kind of like red light districts and then right in the middle of that you've got these little hospitals where women are examined for uh, contagious diseases like syphilis uh, yep that falls out of favour in India and then reappears again in in England 30 years later as a as a way of controlling sex workers in in the uh, the the, the uh, newly developed industrial cities and it's really interesting to to see how there's a kind of attack on 
women who may be outside or distracting from the patriarchal systematic way of making money are attacked mm. you know and how you know that that seems to roll around the globe depending on where people are, are at in their industrial you know where countries are at in their industrial revolutions or their capitalist developments you know i think it's really interesting so at the moment you know my own study is webcamming and we have a lot of debate around trafficking and physical sex work but no discussion at all about webcamming which is entirely legal and where everyone's hooking up online anyway. It's so funny the way like we're in such a state of cognitive dissonance around sex work. It's like how people manage to put bits of it in boxes and then just deny other bits of it. And, pretend. and it's like the same way that, that people will go, oh, that's absolute, I would never do that. What an absolute terrible thing to do. And then they'll go on and wank off over porn. Yeah, exactly. and it's, just, it's, it's really strange that people will have these ideas that, that oh, it's all terrible, but won't, won't look at their own behaviour and what they do within that context at all. And we've done that all throughout history, like the Contagious Diseases Act that you mentioned, there, that was a really crap effort to try and control venereal disease in the troops, but they didn't apply that to the troops themselves. It was <laughs> only to the women. So how the hell is that going to work? you know it's not, not going to do anything is it but no. it's that that was enforced for years in britain and it's about 20 years that they were doing this in certain towns it's perfectly legal to just drag any woman that you suspected of selling sex off the streets and force her to to submit to a vaginal examination nuts nuts i liked this one and i think this was really important because the imagery of, of sex work always really bothers me. And I know there's, we've got colleagues that are kind of really interested in that. But what I like a lot about your book is that we have groups of people together, not, not engaged necessarily in like or, 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 orgies or anything like that, but who are together. Yeah, so I like these pictures of Victorian women with their friends, yeah. I like, you know, that image where we're, we're removed from that that image that we see nowadays of like a lone pair of female legs that seem to, to, to represent all sex workers, to actually people being together. And what was really, what I really noticed was your chapter about male sex work. Mm, yes. And the way that, you know, the way that, that they were so openly looking at the camera was kind of almost like engaged in a sexual act, but without actually acknowledging. So they're looking at the camera rather than each other's genitals. Yes. Yeah, they're engaging with the camera person. So you get the impression of like sort of a more sociable activity. It's so true. It's what you, that's one of the things that I love most about Victorian pornography. And it's one of the things that is markedly different from modern pornography and I think it's because they're still working out the technology they're working out what looks sexy and you can really tell it in some of the early images there's kind of like a what if, if I do this how about that and does this look sexy some of them have got taxidermy in it like this one's one who's got a stuffed dog in it I just love to have heard the conversation but I think I think it needs a dog does it need a dog does that work but one of the things that I really like about it is the people are like they're having loads of fun yeah it's you know like that they're laughing and they're smiling and they they look like they they, they care I might, I might be creating narratives around it and I've got no right to but in modern pornography it's like you know like show that you're caught in these absolute ecstasies of wild desire that you know that it's like oh my like eyes roll back in your head and it's absolutely crazy which is great sex but it's you know the Victorian pornography it's like they're laughing and they're having fun and it's a different setup completely and I yeah. love that about it yeah, you can you can you get the sense that they were they were kind of getting sort of turned on as they were recording. Yes, because I I heard I think it was a TED talk one time and this guy was talking about you don't see hands in pornography. That's so true. You That's don't so see true. hands in pornography, and you in in this in your book, like people are touching each other and they're kind of like exploring each other. Um, yes. You know, especially the women, it's almost that they're exploring each other, and it's it's so unindustrial. Un unindustrial that's that's the perfect word for it is it it looks playful and you know it you know they look like they're aroused and having fun they yeah. really do which is like you know when you look at modern pornography you'd think that well you know that's all geared to like right absolute hardcore we are this is so sexy this is but, but yeah. the victorian stuff actually looks like real people really having sex yeah which, which i guess is 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 what it was you know and i i love that about it it's it's I think it's very erotic but it's also very 
revealing about how what we regard as an erotic image has changed and shifted yeah yeah I think I wonder as well if there's a connection between a sort of like more mass production mass production of uh, pornographic images and less hair being visible so I it- think yeah I think you're probably right I think that pubic hair and its disappearance has got to be linked to in part at least to the availability of images because mm. one of the reasons there's so much pubic hair in Victorian erotica is because you know no one's told them not to have it we're currently in a cycle at the moment because all the porn, unless you look for specialist stuff, everyone's cue bold, like nobody has pubic hair. So then that becomes the normal. Who's going to break that? And because most of the images that we see around sex come from porn as we are growing up and developing, that becomes normal. Yeah. So that, and it's really hard to shift that. If the, if the, Im- the only images that you're seeing are, you know, there's absolutely no pubes there. There's no labia or it's been trimmed back or you know like it's been bejazzled and buffed and shined and all the rest of it that's the normal but it's not normal is it it's just it's a very strange thing that when i think it's because of the images it's because that creates a reality that you see you know You, you see more images in porn than you see in real life when it comes to genitals i mean like you know you don't sit around with your mates and as you're growing up but well maybe you do and sort of show each other's but you probably most exposure is going to be in porn as you're developing i suppose yeah it's going to be your formative stuff isn't it your form that's the word I'm looking for, formative stuff yes okay i have to ask about the, the monkey testicles yes tell us about the monkey testicles <laughs> so i think you might be my favorite chapter that one i love that that was so <laughs> it, it's just bonkers right in the early 20th century Science was just starting to get to grips with hormones, therapies. Hormones have been discovered. We know what they do. They do stuff. And there was a lot of kind of excitement around like, oh, my God, what can we, what can we do with it? And um, one theory that, that came up was that men uh, lose their hair or as they're aging or they might, you know, lose their erections as they're growing up because the testosterone levels drop. So the idea suddenly comes in, oh, we can give them more testosterone. Oh, then we'll fix everything. And. But the theory was that came out was that if you grafted an implant from a chimp's testicle into a human male subject, into his testicle, that this would somehow rejuvenate his own hormone levels. And the the, the guy who kind of pioneered this was called Voronov. He was a, a Russian-born surgeon and he became hugely famous for it for this and he there were so many had so many testimonials that swore down that it was the most amazing thing thing ever and he was really riding high on this for about 10 years before people started trying to replicate his results and didn't get anything at all that he kind of fell out of favor and he became a quack regarded as a quack but this was like really this was such big business right and it was so huge that in the 1920s in Chicago this is quite disturbing but there was a number of cases of young men waking up in an alleyway with no memory of what happened the night before and they were very very sore in the groin area and when they went to hospital it turned out that they had had their scrotal sac removed and then stitched back up and the the no one was ever caught for it. There were three cases of this happening. And the theory is that somebody was paying to have their testicles so they could be grafted into the body of someone presumably very rich and powerful who could do this. But it was, yeah, it was reported in the press as gland larceny. No. Swear down. Yep. You can all have a look. Can look at it up and the, and if you couldn't afford to have a monkey or some poor bugger testicles grafted into your own, there was a big... Uh, vogue for gland cream like face creams and and lotions and potions that supposedly had glands quote unquote testicles in them wow what human testicles are animal Uh, i'm gonna say animal testicles although i don't have any around to test i don't know how many how much testicles are in these creams but they were certainly being sold as reduce like you know elixirs of youth wow yeah wow wow so Bearing in mind sort of like the, the, the whores of your thing and that the, this this uh, podcast will, you know, sort of, will be the first of many where we do discuss sex, but sex work as well. Who's your favourite whore of your? Oh, wow. Oh. Obviously, Clarissa must be up there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, maybe Nell Gwynn. 
I think I think that that she was uh, like she started like she, apparently she was born in a brothel 17th century um and she kind of shagged away right to the top and became the mistress of Charles II and was hugely hugely powerful in yeah. her own right and she was also really funny she, there's lots of cases of just how witty she is and like a really acerbic wit she seems like a lot of fun so I think she's probably one of my favorites um, one that I'm looking at at the moment is an artist called Pan Yuliang, who was Chinese, and she was sold to a brothel by her uncle when she was 14, and she had her freedom bought by the man who had become her husband at 18. She started studying art and painting these amazing nudes, and she started traveling around the world, but then things, attitudes started changing in China in the 1930s, and her past as a sex worker was used very much against her in the fact she was painting nudes. She had to flee China and never went back, and but lived out the rest of her life, eking out a living in France, um, teaching art. But her work is just absolutely and un- it's so beautiful. These she just she, I suppose she's using herself as a model a lot. But her exploration of the female body and she's got to be one of my favourites. She's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always been really fascinated by Theodora. You know the Empress oh. Theodora. Because yeah. she's <laughs> she's born she's born in a brothel and she's kind of like literally she's like the empress of the known world. Yes. And, yeah. and uh, you know, sort of at the at the time when the Christianity was starting to be sort of shaped, you know, she's very much used to kind of start to uh, sort of create the image of of the Virgin Mary. You know, this is where we find sort of Theodora being sort of like sort of almost um, what's the word mainstream. Yeah, but she was, I mean, Theodora was a bad bitch. She was just incredible. She was so powerful. Uh, she was known by like her enemies who were dismissed as Theodora from the brothel. It was yeah. like a kind of, a, uh. but she was married to the, the emperor. She was a hugely powerful woman. And she passed protective rules for women and, around and for sex. Yeah, yes. around procuring and pimping. She did. She did. So she's absolutely incredible. Oh. So yeah, she she'd definitely have to be up there, one of my favourites. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I it's really interesting as well that discussion, like, and it's quite odd, odd that some of the you, you we've been talking now for three quarters of an hour, and we've only just started to talk about <laughs> procure, procuring or pimping. Yeah. Yes, because that is like people's most you know that's the general conversation starts off with tra- trafficking yep. and abuse. Um, but I sort of like, I was really interested in what you'd found out about the relationships, the personal relationships that sex workers have outside of sex work. Yes. I mean, that's, again, that's a stereotype, isn't it? Is, mm-hmm. and, and that is a part of sex work, pimping, procuring, trafficking. They all exist within it. It's, you can't pretend that it doesn't, but it's, it's one part of a much wider puzzle. And I think that one of the things that we have this idea is that that well uh, what a sex worker is that they would never be able to assume some kind of quote unquote normal relationship or normal life uh, which just isn't the case at all right. of course it's not is it is work you go home you know you've you've done your day's work and you have a a family and that's been true throughout history absolutely yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think I've asked you this, but what did you, what is it that you found out that was most interesting to you that really kind of resonated with you? What really kind of about researching this book really opened up something that you were totally not expecting to find? I suppose if you look at like all throughout history or as much of it as possible, you start to see that attitudes to sex work are very circular. Like we, it's like we keep doing the same shit and it doesn't work. It's in this cycle constantly of of uh, repression, uneasy tolerance. Um, okay, we'll kind of, and then repression starts to come in again. Then criminalization, then then suppression, and then that doesn't work. And then we're back to kind of uneasy tolerance. There've been so many laws passed throughout history to attempt to abolish or control or zone or all these things, and they always result. They don't work. And it's, you know, kind of looking at it like in a very long history is you kind of, you end up just going, why do we keep doing this? It's yeah. never worked. You know, like the one thing that people don't try or haven't until this century and last century is decriminalization and just letting people get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. So 
because because like obviously anything to do with sex anything to do with sex workers like for the reasons that you've just described it's like heavily politicized mm. and sort of like really attracts binaries of exploitation or liberation and tends to attract a lot of attention what was the feedback that you got from writing this book it's been mostly good i think people say nice things people say that it made them laugh it made them think uh because I write about sex and because I write about sex work and because I uh, so I don't fight for the abolition or suppression of sex work, is that invites haters. You know, of course it does. They, it, I'm sure that they hate it, <laughs> but they haven't said anything directly to me just yet. So at the moment, the result has been positive but when you write about sex and sex work, as you know, is you're always going to piss someone off. Always. Yeah. But you're, um, you're a lecturer at the University yes. of Leeds, yeah? Leeds how Trinity. You, how do your students react to your, to your book? <laughs> they love it. They, we, have, we have a great time. Um, they've just, the university have just let me start teaching a module called Sexuality Studies which okay. um, after a long time of wrangling and, and being like, no, come on, come on, let me teach something, let me teach something. Uh, and we've done it. And sex work is a big part of that, looking at it. And it's, it's brilliant. And they've loads of students signed up to it and they're really engaged and it's what they want to talk about and it's what they want to, to research. So the students have been absolutely amazing. They're, yeah. they're lovely. They're hugely enthusiastic and they think it's really funny. Well, the thing is, the more, the more we can talk about sex work, right? the more we can talk about the different varieties of sex work. You know, it's sort of Absolutely. like, you know, it's only very recently that we've started to engage in a conversation around trans sex workers. But, yes. we, you know, they've always been part of the sex working community, but it's almost like it's only recently that we've been able to even have that discussion. Yes. You know, um, I wondered at the moment, what other books you're reading? You know, sort of sex work related books you're reading? No, I've just... Uh, I've just finished writing, actually, a book on the history of sex work for Thames and Hudson. So I have been reading so much. And the thing that I've been reading recently is about sex work in the First and Second World Wars. That's, okay. been, that's what I've been, been reading about. Um, and about how different nations and different fighting nations and what their approach to attempting to control sex work was. Oh. So that's, yeah, that's been really interesting. And... Um, yeah. Julia Late, she wrote, um, I can't remember the exact title, but she wrote a fantastic book about sex work from the late Victorian to the Second World War. And that's been really useful. She's a, an amazing scholar. Yeah, I've read that book. I've read that book as well. I think, I want to say Common Women. Is it that, you might, that sounds right, actually. I want to say Common Women, but that's a really good book because, you know, I'd like to sort of, you know, towards, uh, we're coming to the end of the interview now. So I just, I just wanted to, you know, like some recommendations of books that maybe we could feature later on in the series. You know, so Julia Lake, definitely. And obviously so, re Revolting Prostitutes by... Gina yeah. Mack and Molly yeah absolutely that's that's yeah. phenomenal I've um I've reached out to them but they've you know they're, they're not doing any public uh, publicity Fair because enough. of the amount of flack that they got writing as active <laughs> sex workers awful you know they really, awful. they really got some sort of like some some really negative feedback um this has been amazing so anyway so just to, you know, if you can give the, the, the listeners the details of the book that we've just been discussing for the last hour. Oh, I would love to. So it's A Curious History of Sex, and it's by me, Kate Lister, and it's published by Unbound, and it's available in all the places you'd get books from. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. thank you so much, Kate. That has been amazing. Thank you for starting this series with it's a really pleasure. interesting hands-on look at sex.